so uh, I'm going to tell you about this thing here, cosmology with the redshifted H1 21 centimeter line, which is quite a bit of jargon to start with. So let me uh, spend a little time, hopefully by the end of the talk, at least this jargon will be uh, something uh, which, which you will understand, if not the rest of the content. To give you the background, we have this model for cosmology where uh, we live in an expanding universe. The universe is expanding. Uh, I won't go into all the details of this, but uh, the fact is that because of the expansion of the universe, the wavelength of light increases as it propagates to us from a distance. And there is an observer here, we are the observer here, we are receiving light from a distance here and the right light is emitted at a wavelength lambda emitted by the time it comes to us because of the expansion of the universe, it be, we see it at a wavelength lambda emitted into 1 plus z, where this z is the redshift and this will play an important part in my talk and that is why that is the meaning of the term redshifted which appears in the title. Okay. Now, so we can measure this redshift sitting here if I know the wavelength at which the light was emitted, if I can measure the observed wavelength and the larger the redshift, the further away the light is coming from, the source is further away. Not only is the source further away, but light takes a finite time to travel. So we are looking back into the past. So the higher the redshift, the further back into the past we are looking. And this allows us to probe the history of the universe, of what happened in the universe. Okay. <clears throat> now, this 21 centimeter line, so H1 refers to neutral hydrogen and neutral hydrogen in the atomic ground state, there is a hyperfine splitting. We know that there are electron, there is one electron and one proton inside and they have spins. So, if the sp there is a spin flip, there is a slight change in energy the radiation, the energy difference comes out in the form of radiation, which has a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So, H1 is neutral hydrogen, this is spectroscopic notation and the radiation due to this hyperfine transition is at 21 centimeters and if the hydrogen is far away, it will get redshifted by the time it comes to us. In terms of frequency, it is 1420 megahertz and if the hydrogen is far away, the frequency will be lower by a factor 1 plus z. And why are we so concerned about hydrogen? Uh, in the current understanding of the universe, if you consider the present constituents of the universe, we now believe that 70 percent of his is something unknown called dark energy, which we do not see directly, but we infer its existence. 26 percent is something called dark matter, again, which we do not see directly, but we infer its existence from the gravitational effect. Both of these are gravitationally felt. 4 percent only is what we are sure about. These are the baryons, the protons, neutrons, everything that you see around you, they are all just within this 4 percent. Of this 4 percent, which we know about, which we know what they are, 25 percent is helium and 75 percent hydrogen by mass. All the things, heavy elements are minuscule, minuscule, okay. They do not, very small. I mean, this is the, slightly less than 25 and 75, but they are much less than 1 percent. Okay. So, hydrogen is the most abundant known constituent of the universe, which is why I am focusing on hydrogen. Okay. Let me also introduce one more ingredient in of our universe, in the universe, one more ingredient in my talk, which is the cosmic microwave background, CMB. So, we in this picture, we are sitting here and we are receiving a radiation coming to us from all directions, more or less uniformly from all directions. You take a radiometer and point it in any direction you like, you will get this, receive this radiation and the spectrum of this radiation has been measured and it is a black body radiation to a great degree of precision and the temperature is 2.73 Kelvin at present. Okay. So, we are here receiving this radiation from all direction. As you go further away, back in the past further away, the higher redshifts, the temperature of this radiation increases and by a redshift of 1000, the radiation was hot enough, so redshift of 1000 is here in this picture, the radiation was hot enough to have ionized everything, all the hydrogen in the universe. Okay. 
So before a redshift of 1000, the universe was ionized. That is the inner shell over there, the inner side of this shell. And the CMB which I am talking about essentially originates from there and it is uniform to a great degree, but there are slight undulations of the order of 10 micro Kelvin. This is an image of the universe as it was at a redshift of 1000, this CMB, because it is originating from this surface at a redshift of 1000. And there are tiny fluctuations on top of this 2.73 Kelvin of the orders of 10 micro Kelvin, which has been imaged by this satellite and there are other satellites also which have imaged this. Okay. This is going to play an important part in my talk also. Okay. Now, what happens? Let me explain this to you. So, in this, this picture is, a, is going to play a crucial role in my talk. So, let me explain this picture. I am the observer sitting here. I am looking out and as I go further out, the redshift increases. At a redshift of 1000, the whole un, above this, the whole universe is ionized. The CMB, these photons cannot propagate far because of the ionized material they get scattered repeatedly. Once you come to a redshift of 1000, the universe becomes neutral, the mean free path of these photons becomes practically infinite and the photons come to us. Now, as I already told you, at redshift of 1000, hydrogen also becomes neutral and the whole universe is filled with hydrogen. So, the CMB which we are observing propagates to us through this neutral hydrogen. Okay. And this neutral hydrogen, so let us see here. Okay. So, hydrogen here has this hyperfine transition. So, it will interact with the CMB photons at 1420 megahertz, but that radiation will be red shifted and we will observe the hydrogen here, the effect of the hydrogen here at 50 megahertz. Okay. Red shift of 6, we will observe at around 300, 200 megahertz, okay, 200 megahertz. So, the hydrogen will be imprinted at 1420 megahertz, but by the time it comes to us, from different distances, it will be imprinted at different frequencies in the CMBR. So, it will, if there was no hydrogen, the temperature would be 2.73 plus minus those tiny fluctuations. Hydrogen, the intervening hydrogen will introduce some extra fluctuations both in frequency and direction depending on the state of the hydrogen and these are the quantities of interest. We refer to these as the brightness temperature fluctuations in the background radiation at very, these fluctuations will be at very low frequencies this part of the CMB spectrum and this is the formula which you can use to calculate these fluctuations. Uh, this is our contribution, we contributed this term uh, to this expression for the formula for calculating the brightness temperature fluctuations. But I hope the idea, I am not going to the details of this expression, I hope the idea is clear that there will be fluctuations in this background radiation at very low frequencies because of its interaction with the neutral hydrogen as the radiation propagates to us from the last, from this surface. Okay. <coughs> so, this is the basic idea. Now, let me outline to you the evolution of the hydrogen in the universe. So, of the neutral hydrogen. So, the hi neutral hydrogen first appears in the picture at a redshift of 1000. At a redshift of 1000, the universe has no structures, no stars, no galaxies, nothing, nearly uniform and there is only this neutral hydrogen. It, it is there, okay, here. Now, it is more or less uniform with tiny fluctuations in it and the CMB interacts with it, okay. And you, this dark, this is called the dark age of the universe, the dark ages of the universe, okay. And the CMB is, the, the hydrogen here produces absorption features in the CMB. I am not going to talk about it in any detail, okay. Now, something very interesting happens at a redshift of 30. You can see here, right, till a redshift of 30, the hydrogen distribution is more or less uniform. Once you hit a redshift of 30, you start seeing these kind of bubbles. Okay, so, something very interesting happens. This is called the epoch of reionization. So, the neutral hydrogen gets reionized again. Let me explain this to you. Okay, epoch of reionization. Let me explain this to you. So, what happens? What is the background? I have to give you some background for this. So, the observations of the CMB tell us that at a redshift of 1000, universe had only tiny fluctuations. If you look at the universe around us, this is a galaxy, a very big fluctuation. The galaxies themselves, so each picture in this galaxy, in this, each point in this uh, picture is a galaxy. The galaxies themselves, you can see that they are not uniformly distributed, there are big fluctuations. So, at high redshift, early in the universe, you had a very uniform universe. 
near us, redshift 0, you have these big fluctuations. How does this happen? We believe that this is the process of gravitational instability. These tiny fluctuations grow. Places where there is more matter attracts matter. Places where there is an under density, will, matter will flow out and they will give rise, they give rise to these structures that we see. The dynamics is, of this is dominated by the dark matter. One more thing I should tell you. So, it is believed that this process occurs in, in this way. So, small objects form first, they merge to give you bigger objects, they merge to give you even bigger objects. So, you maybe form small galaxies, this is all in the dark matter though, okay. You form small dark matter halos, dark matter clumps, bigger dark matter clumps, even bigger dark matter clumps inside which galaxies are formed, okay. So, at a redshift of, thou, of 30, you have dark matter halos <coughs> into which the baryons, a small amount of baryons can flow. Dark matter does not emit any light, but by a redshift of 30, there are these big clumps of dark matter, dark matter halos into which the baryons can flow, the protons and neutrons and this gives rise to galaxy formation, okay. And once you have galaxies, they emit photons, photoionization. So, they, the stars and black holes in these galaxies, they emit, so there is a lot of ultraviolet radiation coming out from there. This ultraviolet radiation will cause the surrounding neutral hydrogen to get ionized and as the universe evolves, this, these hydrogen, these ionized bubbles grow and the entire universe by a redshift of 6 is completely ionized. Let me show you a picture of <coughs> what this looks like. This is a simulation. So, this is a simulation which we have carried out. Other people have also carried. These are the dark matter halos where galaxies are forming and the radiation, ionizing radiation comes out from here. This is the neutral hydrogen. You can see that these bubbles are being formed. These bubbles grow. And by a redshift of 6, there is no more hydrogen left. This is the epoch of reionization. At a redshift of 6, the diffuse hydrogen is all ionized. But there are still clumps of hydrogen in which are, what are the galaxies basically, right? The dark matter halos have clumps of hydrogen in them. This is the post reionization era. In this era, the hydrogen is contained in these clumps. And again, I have a simulation. Well, uh, <laughs> let me see if I can, right. So, you can see that the hydrogen now traces the large scale structures. You have this thing called the cosmic web. This is how structures in the universe grow. I am zooming into it and then it is going to evolve slowly and you will get, uh, you can see the cosmic web becoming more and more prominent as the universe evolves, okay. So, we are, we are essentially seeing the formation of large scale structure as traced by the redshifted 21 centimeter radiation, okay. <clears throat> now, finally, now let us ask the question, ask the question, what do we see? What do we observe? What do we expect to observe? So, this, <coughs> what we will observe is that the brightness temperature at those low frequencies will fluctuate with direction on the sky as well as frequency. For example, this is a representative picture of what the fluctuations will look like at different redshifts in the epoch of reionization, okay. The way we analyze this is that we take, go into Fourier space where we have these wave vectors and we have the amplitude of the fluctuations in Fourier space and we consider the square of this to calculate what is called the power spectrum. This shows you the power spectrum as a function of the wave number for different redshifts. The bottom line of the whole thing is it gives you an estimate of the brightness temperature fluctuations you expect to observe in the sky because of this redshifted 21 centimeter. The variance of this brightness temperature fluctuation is predicted to be of the order of 10 to 100 milli Kelvin square, okay. So, the hydrogen will produce fluctuations of this kind which if you can detect you can actually see what happened in early parts of the universe, okay. Now, this is a picture of the sky, an existing map at 408 megahertz, so called Haslam map. You can see that this whole sky actually has a radiation uh, which is 
much higher, much hotter. And what we are trying to see is a small thing in this. Okay, this is our galaxy, our own galaxy. Our own galaxy emits this enormous radiation, which is already there. Okay, and we are trying to see <coughs> this small, tiny thing, 10 to 100 millikelvin square, in this. Okay. Anyway, we went ahead. So other people also did. Uh, I'll just tell you some of our results. So we observed a small part of the sky here, 4 degree by 4 degree field, uh, <coughs> using this. Uh, we did a very small observation using. GMRT, this is pretty old, 2008. And the picture of what you get from your observation looks like this. You can see all these points. Each point there is an extragalactic radio source, an AGN, okay, cosmological source. So we, we are, the sky at radio frequencies of interest, 150 megahertz here, is dominated by these point sources. So we now went ahead and subtracted the point sources, removed them. And what you get is an image that looks like this, sorry. You can see these diffuse structures and we quantified this. This is actually our galactic synchrotron radiation. It has shows a beautiful, the power spectrum shows a beautiful power law attributed to MHD turbulence. But the bottom line of all this is that there are these enormous foregrounds which are four to five orders of magnitude brighter, okay. It's the biggest challenge that we have. So let me just, so our first work in this field actually started with this paper 2001 which I wrote with two of my collaborators who are now both in RRI. It was published in this journal JAPA published uh, which is brought out by the Indian Academy of Sciences and we were largely motivated by the GMRT which was coming up at that time. Okay. And this was a theoretical prediction. We went ahead. Now there are many telescopes which have been specifically built to observe these 21 centimeter uh, <laughs> do cosmology with the 21 centimeter radiation. What's our aim? So the, the GMRT has many, many antennas and we look at pairs of antennas as, they, as the earth rotates, they sweep out a track and the quantity that is measured is called a visibility. We want to take this visibility and there are these brightness temperature fluctuations in the sky. This is the sky, the perpendicular direction to the line of sight. We can directly image this using a telescope. The depth we cannot get directly from the frequency because each redshift corresponds to a different distance, a different frequency. From the frequency we can get the depth. So we now break it into Fourier modes, k perpendicular, k parallel. And we have the visibilities from that we want to estimate the power spectrum. Okay. So we uh, propose, we gave this formula also which allows us to estimate the power spectrum with, from the visibilities. Uh, my colleague Shif Sethi and I, pretty old, 2001. And we have been doing different works with this, trying to estimate, try to build estimators for the 21 centimeter signal. Uh, I was hoping to tell you about some recent work carried out in collaboration with three of my students, ex-student and ex-student and present student, many other collaborators also. So we have developed, we <coughs> were analyzing some further GMRT observations and we have developed something called the tapered grid estimator. We are also working on methods for foreground removal. <coughs> okay, let me not give you the details. Let me just go to the summary of uh, what I wanted to convey. So, <coughs> we are trying to study the universe. There are galaxy surveys which map out the galaxy. They let us probe a small part of the universe here around redshift zero where we live. There are, is the CMB, you can observe the fluctuations. They tell us the details of the universe at a redshift of 1000 far away. In between the neutral height, there are very few probes in between. This redshifted 21 centimeter radiation observations can be used to probe this entire region practically, what's, what's going on there. And you can, I told you about three different phases, stages in the evolution, the dark ages. This is possibly the only method by which you can study the dark ages. You can observe <coughs> The first galaxies being formed, first stars being formed through the reionization. You can study how these structures are formed after once the universe is reionized. I tried to give you a picture that foregrounds are the big challenge. So you have to overcome this. Still, we are still working, people are still working on this. And we have been developing estimators, also doing theory and simulations regarding this. Thank you very much. Dark. Dark matter. Yeah. In your 21 centimeter hydrogen, right. is there a way to directly observe? Some can you make prediction? Something that we know 
that there is a dark matter for sure. I mean, you know, these are indirect observations, but direct. No, from I mean, this. And one of the candidates for the dark matter, and you know what? Yeah, well, this has some, uh, I mean, the powers, if you can observe the matter power spectrum in the post reionization era, that can constrain dark matter. But it will not tell you exactly what it is, but it can constrain. So, there are neutrinos or the, the basically the nature of the dark matter will affect the power spectrum at very small scales, for example, right. So, and it can also affect the reionization process. We ourselves have written a paper. Uh, where if you have different dark matter scenarios, the way the halos form gets modified. Okay. So, all these things are there indirectly in the 21 centimeter signal. So, if you can detect it and uh, if it matches your dark matter predictions, some models will be ruled out, some models will be acceptable. One last question. Actually, it is more or less a continuation of Avinash's question and that refers to the last point that you are making. That… Uh, this one? No, the simulation part because ah. I think I understood… Oh, okay your major challenge of removal of foregrounds right, and that's right. for observational challenge right, right but to translate those observations into the kind of quest answers to the right, questions that right, avinash right. was asking right. you really need the simulation right right you so i wanted to know right. what is the size of the simulation and what is what kind of numerical uh, input uh, and yeah. So let, 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 let me address your question. So uh, you see the epoch of reionization simulations, for example, they, the dynamical scale required is enormous because we want to simulate <laughs> a large volume, right? A large part of the large volume of the universe, and the uh, the radiation sources are possibly stars, which are extremely small scales, right? So you really cannot uh, span all these length scales and mass scales. So if you are looking at large scale, then you make some ad hoc assumption about these, uh, not ad hoc. So, you will, somebody will do small scale simulations, he will tell you what is happening there and then you put them in your large scale simulations. Then there is radiative transfer. So, we have done very simplistic simulations which give you some idea of what the thing will be, okay. Now, if you want to get more, uh, but many things can be ruled out just by the halos. You see, if you have a, if you modify the dark matter behavior, the halos will not be formed. Okay. It's a qualitative. No, 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 it's quantitative also. You take the, so the halos are not put in by hand. We have a dark matter model, the power spectrum, we put in the power spectrum, calculate the halos and then we, the radiation from each halo we just put in by hand. Okay, but the dark matter halos are from the simulations, that there is no. So, you can rule out some certain masses. Right, right, once you have the observation. Okay, some masses, some scenarios of dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, some these things. Right, right, you can rule out. For, the, for example, we looked at the fuzzy dark matter scenario, right. So, some thing, some of these can be ruled out by observations of. Reanimation will occur later, far earlier, these things are there. Okay, thanks for a very interesting talk.